All right, so we're going to continue on with RNNs. Uh, and today we're going to talk about uh, gated units. So a reminder of an RNN, right? We have kind of this. This is unrolled, right, where we have this sequence. And we're feeding in, at any given point in the sequence, an x. We're feeding in some hidden state from the previous time step. We multiply the hidden state by its own weight matrix, multiply the input x by its own weight matrix, add them together, add them a bias that I'm not showing, apply some uh, activation function, and then we continue on to the next time step, and so on. And when we get to the very end, we take the hidden unit, feed it into y, again using some weight matrix and some activation function, we get our y. So, Loss functions for an RNN often are just the final output, the y hat from the very last time steps. So often we just ignore all the previous y hats. If we are not ignoring the previous y hats, that, if, uh, that is, if we go ahead and take this y hat and this y hat and they all feed in to the loss function, then it's fairly easy to push error back all the way to all these time steps. Because we have a direct connection from a loss to, let's say, a particular y hat, back into the hidden value, and then that can affect these weight matrices here. But if we don't use these y hats, if we have a final y hat, like let's say we have a classification problem, right? We have a piece of text, every time we classify it. Perhaps we're classifying it as to um, whether it's positive or negative, so it's sentiment. Perhaps we're classifying an author. Is this William Shakespeare or Francis Bacon or someone else who wrote it? Something like that. And in that case, it can get very hard to push our error back. We're very likely going to have either a vanishing or exploding gradient. Let's just kind of look at why. So as we go from, right, so we have the partial derivative of the loss, and we're trying to calculate with respect to some hidden state h sub i. Okay, back. Let's just make it h sub t minus 1. We're trying to calculate that. And we know we can calculate that by we only have one path there, because okay, so we're not including all the other y hats. And so we know we have to go through here, back through all the previous ages. So we're gonna have, we know we're going to have to take the loss with respect to, let's say, h of capital T, which is the last hidden value, the last time step. Multiply that by the derivative of h of t over h of t minus 1. And then we're going to just live with capital T's and lowercase t's. So capital T is the last one. Lowercase t is sort of in the middle where we're looking at. So eventually, we're going to get to the derivative of h sub lowercase t over h sub t minus 1. And the question is kind of what is this composed of? We have this product of a lot of these partial derivatives from one time step to the previous time step. We've got the activation function, but then we've also got this in the forward pass multiplying by this matrix, right? So in the backward pass, we've got to multiply by the transpose of the matrix. And so effectively, we have the weight matrix, the HH matrix, transpose, but I'm not going to bother with that, to some power. Uh, t minus lowercase t plus or minus 1, I'm not sure here, right? But this taken to a fairly large power. Well, what happens to a matrix as you take its power? Now, what does that tend towards in the limit? Big, small? I mean, let's say we have a bunch of large values in this matrix. Every value is greater than 1. This is going to get really big. Every value is between 0 and 1. It's going to get really small. So if we look like at the eigenvalue, right, 
then that would tell us whether whether we're growing or shrinking or sort of staying the same. But it could very easily grow or shrink. That is leading to either an exploding or vanishing gradient. And the vanishing gradient is especially bad, right? Our exploding gradient, what's our fix for that, uh, Matt? Our, our two choices for clipping, right, is we can we come up with some max value and we either clip and say anything bigger than that gets clipped to that, or we say we're going to scale everything so that the entire uh, uh, norm of it is no lar larger than that. Right? So the first, in some senses, is simpler, uh, and we're re reducing fewer values. The problem is we're actually changing directions. Okay? The last one, we keep the same direction, we just don't go as far. So that'll fix the exploding gradient, but the vanishing gradient we don't have a solution for. What'll happen basically is all of these values here, when we get back to here, are kind of ignored, right? Our error is small, so this error isn't going to be affecting the WXH matrix, isn't going to be affecting the WHH matrix here. So only the more recent uh, values are going to be affecting that. So you can think of it as we really have a limited history, a limited window that we're looking back on. That is the fix at these gated units. That's what they're there for, to try and fix this. So they can try and come up with a mechanism such that you don't have this vanishing gradient. Does the problem make sense? Okay. Uh, let me motivate something. So let me, let's say we're trying to model, and we're going to look at this in more detail a little bit later. We're trying to model Wikipedia articles. Okay? So we have, uh, this is what a Wikipedia article looks like. We have, I guess these are maybe references to other articles, I'm not sure. Um, but in Wikipedia markup, this is what it looks like. I'm going to, let's say that's what this is, other Wikipedia articles. And we're going to do, the input of this is going to be actually character at a time. So x of 1 would be capital N, x of 2 would be A, x of 3 would be T, and so on. So we'd have this one hot encoded character. Maybe it's like, say, 256 values, the ASCII character. Okay, so one hot encoded. And we are going to go ahead and try and predict what the next letter is at each point in time. Okay, that's our goal. But you can see we have a very large sequence. So let's say, for example, here, we've seen this first right bracket. What do we predict the next character is going to be in all likelihood? Another right bracket because why? Are there ever any instances of a single right bracket? I'm going to say yes. Let's say we have some parts in the Wikipedia where it has left bracket, something or other, single right bracket. The reason that we know there's a second right bracket here is because we opened it with double left brackets. So because we opened it with double left brackets, that's why we know we're closing it with double right brackets. If we'd opened it with a single right bracket, we would expect only a closing single right bracket. So after the first right bracket, we wouldn't expect another right bracket. How do we do that? We would have to store this information in our hidden state. Right? We'd have to have a hidden state that kind of says, we're in a single open bracket versus we're in a double open bracket. The problem is, as this distance gets fairly large, it would be very hard to push back error all the way back that says, Hey, when we got this single bracket in here, our XH uh, matrix should be updated such that it correctly sets the hidden state to say whether we're in a single hidden bracket, a single left bracket, or a double left bracket. Because that's the state we want to keep track of. And the only way to keep track of that is to be updating this weight matrix so that when we get the appropriate left bracket in, we know what to do. But if that happened too far back, 
then we don't have an easy way to fix it, basically, when we get to this right bracket, to be able to push that error back. So that's, that's some motivation here. We have a bunch of equations. Would you mind making sure everyone gets a copy of that, passing that out? So we have a bunch of equations, and to make sure that <coughs> we uh, all correctly have a copy, you don't have to all copy it down independently and assume that we have neither an error in me of writing up on the board and an error for you of writing on your paper. Uh, but I need one copy of it so that we're all working on the same. All right, I'm going to show this to you pictorially because it's a bunch of equations. Okay, the equations I hope will make sense after we look at the picture. So here's the picture. So LSTM which stands for uh, Santi? Long short term memory. Yes. It's actually relatively old in the sense that it's like 98, I believe. So um, 20 years old and so well before kind of the renaissance in neural networks. So here's what we're going to do. We are going to have, we're going to add a cell. So we already have a hidden state, right? The h sub t, which is our, our hidden state at time t. Now we're going to add a cell, which we're going to call, let's say, c sub t. So in addition to h sub t, we have another value, c sub t. So we're going to look at this at time t. And we are going to take c sub t minus 1 and feed this in to the current c sub t. But we're going to have a little gate here called a forget gate. Okay, so this is f sub t. So c sub t can either be c sub t minus 1 by itself, or we're going to add some other value. But we have this mechanism where c sub t minus 1 can go directly to c sub t. Think of this gate as either on or off, right? That's what this is supposed to represent. In reality, it is a, not a discrete gate, it's a continuous gate that can be, you know, more like when you're turning on a water faucet. It can be either all the way off or all the way on or any point in between. But for now, let's just think of it as either zero or one. It's either on or off. Okay, so we're going to have a gate. And this is going to feed off into the next time step. All right, so what else do we have? Well, we have something that can also feed into C sub t. Right? It would not be very useful to just have a value that could be maintained or not maintained with no way to actually update it to anything. So we have a way to update it. So we're going to have controlled by a gate. Okay? This, this gate idea is quite prevalent. So we're going to have a gate called I sub t. So we have three gates. Gate one is our forget gate. Gate two is our input gate. And gate three is our output gate. So the forget gate says, do we remember the previous value of C or do we not remember the previous value of C? The input gate is controlling what else is coming into C. So what else comes into C? Well, we also have H, T minus 1, coming in, right, from the previous time step. So that comes in here. We've got a weight matrix. 
we've got our x sub t coming in with its weight matrix. We add those together and we apply some function to it. So that's what's coming in to C sub t, is this linear combination of our hidden value from the previous time step and our input at the current time step. Okay, so this part should be quite familiar, right? This part below here. This is just like we were doing before in here. Combining these two, applying an activation function. Yeah. G is the activation function? G is the activation function. Yeah. And this is right, G sub H. So C sub T can be either the old C sub T or, like let's say this gate is open and this gate is closed, then it's the old C sub T. If this gate is this gate is open and this gate is closed, then it is just whatever our, our current calculation is, right, based on the old state. It's exactly like H sub t. If they're both open, what's C sub t? Zero. Zero, yeah. And if they're both closed? Some combination. A combination. Exactly. Well, the sum. It's the sum of them. Okay. A mixture. Uh, we still need to figure out what h sub t is. So h sub t is going to be coming out of here. And it is controlled by a gate. Which gate is it controlled by? Rachel. It's got to be the output gate because we already used the forget gate when we use the input gate. So it's the output gate. Right. So this is the output gate. And I'm putting sub t here, which seems to imply that the settings of these gates is time dependent. And it is. So from time step to time step, the values of these gates, may, some may open, some may close, some may partially close and so on. And h sub t also will go up to <coughs> y hat, right, with a uh, weight matrix y hat sub t, just like it did before. So let's look at this a little bit. The forget gate, for example. Let's look at what it's, what it, how it's calculated. So the forget gate is going to be a sigmoid, which means its value is going to be between, Brendan? Zero and one. Zero and one, right? Uh, which is kind of what we want. We want the gate either to be no more on than all on and no more off than all off, right? Some value between all off and all on. And we are going to have, what do we want this to depend on? Give me some thoughts. What could it depend on? Nick. Allie. Uh, Let's just wait. make something up. That is, how should we determine whether we want to Forget what we used to have or not. Let's say that this is keeping track of we're inside square brackets. At what point would we want to forget we're inside square brackets? When we see, like, the end. When we see a closing square bracket, it's like we're not in square brackets anymore, right? We're not in Kansas anymore. So what information would we use for that? Yeah, there, so let's say this is a Boolean that's, that is keeping track of it. How do we want to control the setting of this? You just said it's whether we just saw a, right, a closing square bracket, right? Yeah. 
So where is that in this diagram? Where's the closing square bracket? X, right? Yeah. If X is a closing square bracket, that may control for this particular piece of information whether we want to pass that on or not. So we want to have something about X in here. What's our standard thing we do with X? <coughs> Multiply by a weight matrix. I think I did say mate matrix. Uh, weight matrix. Weight <coughs> matrix. Yes. So we multiply a weight matrix, not of any of our current weight matrices. We want a new weight matrix. What would we call it? XF. XF. That's right. So we've got our, our weight matrix. So whether we want to forget the old value or not depends in part on what our input is. Jack, what else might it depend on? How else are we going to depend on the Previous, like, state. The previous hidden state seems like a good plan for, right? It, it, it's context dependent that this, that this uh, character that's coming in or this input that's coming in. And so we want to look at the input in conjunction, let's say, with our hidden state. We have a standard way we do that, which is add the, insert the, weight the last hidden state times a weight matrix. What do we call the weight matrix? Mate. That matrix? HF. HF. And while we're there, we'll throw in a bias. Okay. So context-dependent value, sorry, as I told you, this may be on or off different parts in the time step. And the way we do things differently, time step from time step, is by actually looking at the hidden state from the previous time step and the current input. Yeah. I'm a little confused about the diagram. It makes it seem like C sub t and H sub t, if O sub t was closed, would come out as the same thing. Or, or like, is, the, is H sub t dependent on, on C sub t in this case? What's A sub t? A, H sub t, sorry. Oh, H sub t is, uh, I'm going to throw in here, there's one more function here that gets, that gets called here. Um, it basically is O sub t. Okay, so the old h of t minus 1 has to go all the way through c sub t before the new yeah, h of t. Yeah, so the, up. well, it goes through the same process it goes through before, right? We go through and do this combination like we did before. The difference is we have to make it through this gate and we have to make it through this gate, and we may have this thrown in and mixed in with it. That's really the difference. But it's fairly similar to the same uh, process that's going through, of going through this weight, weight, weight matrix. So it's like we have two things. One is going through and having a lot of stuff done to it, and one can go through without any change. When do we want the input gate to be closed? We want the input gate to be closed if, so let's think about that. Let's, let's go back and imagine we're designing this ourselves, right? Because, of course, it's all being learned. But let's go to the square bracket, single square bracket case, okay? So if we see a single, let's, let's assume we have seen a single square bracket, an opening square bracket, and our cell information is like a one, saying we are inside brackets. We said that our, we want this gate to be closed if we see, now we want this gate to open up if we see a closing square bracket, right? So while we're not seeing a closing square bracket, we want this to stay closed. What about this gate? In fact, here's, here's what it is. We saw an opening, we saw an A, B, C, D, and now this is where we are. This is time step T, and the input is in E. What do we want to have happen to this value? It was a 1 saying we're inside square brackets. What do we want it to be after we see the E? 1. 
we know we better close this gate. But what about this gate? Do we want this to be open or closed? If it's closed, whatever this calculates is going to add into this, right? If we were really unlucky, this would be negative, right? That'd be bad. So we don't care, right? If we're inside square brackets and we see an E, does that change whether we're in square brackets? No, we don't, we don't care what's coming in here. We would keep this gate open. Remember, H is a vector, right? H is, you, we might have 256 different hidden states in our RNN. C is a vector. What's F? It's a vector, right? So for every one of our 256 different hidden states, we have 256 different cell states, and every one of those has its own setting for this gate. So when I talk about opening and closing the gate for the square bracket, in square bracket, that's its own setting for the gate. If we have a different cell state that's keeping track of something else, it has its own values for the state, for the gates. Yeah. So, so the output gate, is it, is it going like this, is it going this direction or this direction? The output gate's going down. So this is down like that. So if it's open, then H of T is zero? That's yeah, exactly right. If it's open, H of T is zero. So let's kind of run through and categorize some of these. So if F is one and I is zero, C T equals one. Oh, and I, there's a little bit more I need to give you because when we say this is forget, it sort of sounds like, well, that means if f is 1, we forget, which means the gate is open. And unfortunately, this is really more like a remember gate. So if this is 1, 1 means gate closed. 1 always means the gate's closed. So. If the F gate is closed and the I gate is open, C T is going to be what? Sorry, I have Santi. Just the, the one that you point the sigma, what was the sigma again? Uh, the sigma that's over there? That's just a sigmoid. Oh okay. you know, smashes the between zero and one. Um so you're just like that what you just wrote was just saying in general that the gate is one then. In general, if the, yeah, if the value of the gate is 1, 1 is closed. The value of the gate is 0 is open. And we'll see that with the math. Because basically, we're going to just take it and multiply it by, right? We're going to just take c of t minus 1 times f of t. So therefore, if f of t is 1, it goes through. And if t is 0, it doesn't. Okay. I'm just confused. Is, isn't there a case where you want h of t to get h of t minus 1, but not c to get h of t minus 1? I can't do that. I mean, it's just the way this architecture works, you can't do that. So. This particular case. C of T minus one? Yeah. This is the case we were just talking about. It just passes it right through. So this gets passed through, nothing comes up from here, and it goes on. If F is zero and I equals one, then C of T equals uh, we don't have a name for this right now uh, but it's, it's equal the uh, right, it's equal this right it's equal our calculation uh, with H of T minus 1 and XD. Right. So we are completely forgetting our old value and we're using this new value. Half half means it's a blend. It's half of the old value and half of this value. If O sub T equals zero, 
h sub t equals, you just said this, didn't you? You said it, actually, Jeff. You said it, zero, right? So it's just like, just a, we don't care. Does C, um, C sub t have to be a square matrix? C sub t is not a matrix. C sub t is a vector. Right. It's it's parallel to the H vector. Right. Okay. All right. So let's let's run through the rest of the formulae. And then we'll go through and see why it is this is actually effective as, well, we can see we can have long-term memory, right? If we could learn the gates appropriately, the way we get long-term memory is set F to closed, set I to open, and just make sure you keep doing that until you no longer need that or want to get a new value for it, right? So that setting is fairly easy but we need to see how it is that we can actually propagate error effectively, and we'll get to that in a moment. So this is forget gate sub t, f sub t. i sub t and o sub t are exactly parallel to this. We have a sigmoid, we have x sub t, but we have a special weight matrix. Instead of xf, it's xo or xi, ho or hi, bo or bi. Questions on that? So we have a way to set these gates. And they'll be learned because we'll learn values for the Ws, we'll learn values for the Bs. Jack. I guess conceptually, like, when we were doing this in once, like earlier, and we were like, getting activations of like, like 0.5, that kind of meant that we were like, we didn't really know where, where we were at as far as like, of what we were activating that, that uh, value to be. Here it sort of looks like, you know, if we had, you know, for example, we have like f is like open, and then i is but i is 0.5, then we're just like taking like half of what that is. So that's in fact, if we had f is open and i is 0.5, and we had that over time, then we would have this exponential decay, yeah. right, of c sub t of c, okay. and similarly, we'd have our we'd have a vanishing gradient coming back. The formula for h is really pretty simple. Right? h sub t equals, well, it's just going to be c sub t modulated with this gate. Right? If the gate is 1, it's c sub t. If the gate is 0, it's 0. And if it's in between, we multiply. So we're going to just take o sub t. Why am I doing this funky dot product? Why don't I just say times? Yeah, they're both vectors, and we want to do this pointwise multiplication. Like this is Hadamard product, but pointwise multiplication. So every one of the values of C sub t is going to be multiplied by the associated value of O sub t, and that'll give us our H sub t. And then C sub t, first let's look at this forget gate. Well, we know we want to take the forget gate dot product with the old value of c sub t. And then we want to add in Morgan. What do we want to add in? We don't need a bias at this point. Right? We're looking at this plus right here. This plus is this Plus. And this is this part, and so we've got this part here. Yeah, so what's the first part of the thing we're going to add in? The gate part. I sub t. Yeah, so we're going to do I sub t dot product with, and this is where we've got to have this chunk here. We could pull this out into a separate variable, but let's just write it all in here. So it is common 
to use tanH as the activation function. One can use other activation functions, but that's often what is used. And it's going to be our standard x of t, w, x, I don't know whether to call it C or H. Uh, what did I call it on there? C? C? We'll call it C. C plus the old H times W H H plus a bias. Sorry, not H H, H C plus a bias. This we're very used to. Right? This was just what we used for calculating H of T in the past. This tan H just adds on an activation function. We never really specified what the activation function was before. In this case, we're going to just use tan H. This is the value, this is the new value. Sorry. This is the input value, and this controls how much of it to use. And then we add in how much to take from the past. For H of T on the sheet, it also uses. Yeah, uh, that's a good point. Uh, it's a little weird. Thank you for correcting that. Because it seems like we just used tan H here. So why are we using tan H again? And actually, sometimes this becomes the identity function. So there are folks that say this, this should be the identity function instead of tan H. But what possible reason is there to use tan H? Anyone? Maybe if we don't use, like, I sub t is like open, we don't use that, so we still need a different activation function. So if I sub t is open, we don't have a tan h here. But we have this previous c sub t minus 1, right? So where did this c sub t minus 1 ever come from? It must have eventually had some amount of tan h in it, right? It must have been tan h'd. And then we have some multiplicative factor, less than 1. So we actually do already have a 10H in the C sub T. So I mean, I was actually, this is what I was thinking about this morning. So why do we have two 10 H? Why could we possibly need two 10 H's? And here's what I came up with. Um, 10 H gives you what range? Negative one to one. What is the range of C sub T? Well, what's the range of this tan H? Right, if C sub T ever first gets initialized, it's between negative 1 and 1, right? So this previous C sub T minus 1, let's say, is between negative 1 and 1. Let's say it's 1. We take all of it. And we take this value, and it's tan H. This could be also 1. So we can now be outside of the range negative 1 to 1. And so this tan H takes us back in the range negative 1 to 1. OK? Because these could superimpose on top of each other and start adding more and more, get bigger and bigger. All right, so first question, do these match what we have on the, on the handouts? That's fairly important, I think. All right. Now let's look at our backpropagation and how it is that we can actually ensure that if we have an error somewhere way down the line, that we can push that error far back. You know, for instance, push it far back to when it was first noticing the open bracket so that it could decide, hey, we should actually uh, set a state here. So if we look at the derivative of h of t with respect to h of t minus 1, we still have this WHH, or really it should be, I guess, WHC matrix in here. And so as we go back multiple steps, we're still going to get this matrix multiplied. So that's a problem. But 
if we look at c sub t to c sub t minus 1, that is a little bit different. So let's go ahead and write in We want to actually, we're interested in a couple things. We're interested in the loss with respect to, let's say, C sub t. And we're also, as part of that, going to need to be interested in this. So let's actually just look at the loss first with respect to C sub t. Because if we do find this loss with respect to C sub t, we can then easily determine what our updates are going to be for these weight matrices for this time step. Right? Keep in mind, these are tied matrices, right? shared matrices. And so we need to find what is the loss for these matrices at time step t, at t minus 1, at t minus 2, and all the way back. And then we sum them all together. So what's our path to C sub t? Our loss is over here. We've got H sub t here. Assume we don't go out via y hat for the moment. How does our loss, how, does our, how do we have a path coming back to C sub t? Mm, uh, I guess I really need to put this one in too. So we've got our loss. What's our path to get to c sub t? Right? This is c sub t plus 1. This is a sub t plus 1. This is c sub t. It's either going to be through here or through here. Would you agree? I mean, it's not through here. because This goes earlier in time. So it's either got to be the top or the right. And let's look at that in order. So if it's the top, I mean, I mean really, I guess, it's really both, right? So we're summing up the gradients through all paths, and these are the two uh, direct paths at this time step. So if we look at this time step, at, at this path, to c sub t, we're going to basically be calculating, so this is to c sub t plus 1 times the derivative from c sub t plus 1 to c sub t. This we're not going to worry about right now. We'll just assume we've calculated that. The question is, what's this? And then we'll add on the derivative with respect to h sub t plus 1. Okay. So my question is, what's that? That is, As I make a change to c sub t, how much does it change c sub t plus 1? Right, that's what we mean by the partial derivative. Would it be f sub t? This is equals f sub t. 
If it's one, that gives us a straight push of our error from here to here. And if it was one again, here to here to here to here to here to here to here. Okay? As far back as the forget gate stays one, we're pushing derivative. What does this remind you of? Where we had a path where our partial derivatives were all one, so that we could push error as far down the network as we wanted for convolutional neural nets. ResNet skip connections. So a similar kind of idea, except it's a programmable skip connection, right? Where we can program it to, to be at one or to be something less than one. Yeah. Should this second um, this should be about the H. Yeah. We want to be able to cancel these correctly. Thank you. Okay. So this is really the key that is allowing the uh, error to be pushed back. Okay. Because the network can learn to set this forget gate to one, and, and while for a duration that it's one, that entire duration can push back unmodified. Let's look at the other path. So the other path is we're going to come through here and up and over. What's that derivative going to be? Well, We're starting here at h sub t plus 1, and we're coming through to c sub t. That is, here's a question, as we make a change to c sub t, how much does this affect h sub t plus 1? Okay, so. so as we change c sub t, uh, sorry. Um, there are <coughs> two parts to this. There's actually c sub t plus 1, and then we would multiply by c sub t plus 1 over c sub t. So this is actually the amount I'm interested. As I change c sub t plus 1, how much does that change h sub t plus 1? Exactly. This is the output gate, right? It's that value, the output gate. So if the neural network learns that the output gate should be 0, that means any error from the h term doesn't, doesn't get the error stops. Like, it doesn't affect this, which can be kind of nice. Like, I don't care about that error. Now let's look at a more complicated example slightly, and that is, let's say this actually goes out to y hat sub t plus 1, and that goes into the loss. Okay, so instead of just having a loss at the end, we have a loss coming in in the middle. Whatever loss we have, isn't going to go into this gate, uh, sorry, into c sub t plus 1 if this gate is open. So if we think of it, let's think of it this way. Some gates are going to care about immediate loss, and some gates aren't going to care about the immediate loss coming out of the y hats. And each gate, each, each cell, or each element of the vector, c, gets to decide that independently. It kind of makes sense that if none of this c sub t is going out and going up to y hat, that of course any error here is not its guy's fault. 
right? Because basically, as you change c sub t plus 1, what happens to y hat? Well, if this gate is open, nothing. So therefore, any error doesn't go back through to it, because it's, it's, it's not its fault. It right? doesn't matter what this c sub t is, it's not going to change the loss, at least through this path. Questions? Where does the activation function fit into There were two activation functions that, where there are three activation functions we're using. We're using the sigmoids. So we could say that g sub f equals g sub i equals g sub o equals sigmoid. And then we have g sub c, right, which is when we were calculating, basically, it's this one here. So g sub c equals tan h. And then we have g sub h, which is tan h, or could possibly be the identity function. So there's a g sub h here. g sub h is here, and g sub c is here. Sorry, I meant the gradient. Oh, the gradient? Yeah. That's there too. Okay. We have to worry about uh, Yeah, that's there too. So we do need to deal with that. Okay. All right. Uh, let me give you a preview. First off, your homework is going to require you to become familiar with these equations because you are going to need to learn or figure out by brain power some matrices in order to solve a particular problem. So it'll be the parity problem. You'll get a bunch of bits, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, and you have to figure out what the parity is of it. So you're going to need to be maintaining in C sub t the parity of what you've seen so far. So it's going to require some careful manipulation of these things, but it's just a one value state. So it's a very, very small LSD. I'll give that out on Wednesday. There is a simplified uh, gated unit called a GRU, a gated recurrent unit. I'll show that to you in a moment. What I want to show you now, though, is some um, states that an LSTM has learned. Okay. In particular, let's look at this Wikipedia example. So it was trained on a lot of Wikipedia text. And there's some visualization, basically, of what some of the cells have learned. This is from an article called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of RNNs. There's an also an interesting parallel article called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of CNNs. They are pretty darn effective. So here's the idea. Our text, right, this is from Wikipedia. And so our text is running across the top. There are five columns below. It's the next uh, predicted character. So this is the highest predicted character, next highest, next highest, next highest, and next highest. So for example, when we see a right bracket, it predicts another right bracket. The colors show how highly it's predicted. So dark red is it's really, really pretty confident that that's what it is. White and other things are not so confident. So let's look at some example. And also the thing to keep in mind, back up a second, let's see. That's the confidence. Um, and we are also showing how active a particular cell is. So the green up here shows an active cell. So let's just 
try and figure out what does this cell seem to get excited about? Yeah. Websites? Yeah, websites. Uh, in right, so www.ynetnews.com, www.globes.co.il, wherever il is, www.hiretz.co.il. Um, that's what it seems to get excited about. Notice also that the LSTM as a whole seems to really understand these ideas of HTTP colon slash slash www dot, right? Once it gets into that, like it knows the next characters, it's really confident of what they are until it gets to that final dot. And then, well, I mean, I don't know, after www dot, what's most likely? B, A, S, D, G, M, M. It's kind of hard to tell, right? And so it's not as certain. But once it gets to a C, like dot C, I know what's coming next, right? It's on. It was wrong on the m, right? Because it was a dot. And then it's like, oh my goodness. Dot co dot, why is it a u? I know why, I'm guessing. Yeah? UK, right? That's most likely what it's going to be if it's co dot u. It's going to, or co dot, it's going to be UK. It turns out it's not. It's, what is il? Is it Italy? Is it? Israel. Israel, thank you very much. Oh, Hebrew language. Small, tiny little clues. Okay, so that's one of the cells. Another of the cells this one is when we're inside double brackets, right? Seems to be what this one is liking. Uh, except not until we've got past the first, in almost all cases, past the first two brackets, right? So after the first bracket, it's not very excited. Only after the second bracket then does it start getting excited. It doesn't stop getting excited until it's seen the second closing bracket. So this is the cell vector we were talking about, I guess, that knows I'm inside double square brackets. Right. And again, this is just trained. It happened to, just happened to be learned. But this is important, right? Because that would signify that it's kind of looking for matching, right? It's looking for, it, if once it's given an open double square bracket. It's looking for a closing double square bracket to get out of that mode. Another is, um, this one is within double square brackets, but it seems to, let's see if we can look at this, it gets Greener, you can barely see it here on this outro, but it's, it's going from not very green to very green, kind of linearly across this. So the longer it's in the square bracket. So it tells you how far along you are, kind of. Okay. Here, um, It shuts up a lot right after the second W in www. So maybe it's kind of counting how many Ws. And this is one that says, I, I go um, off completely when I've seen the second W. So, so some other part of the network can, can use that. Let's see, one more thing I wanted to show uh, here. This is just looking at the text for a given cell and seeing how that cell activates. So as we look, this cell seems to be activating as we get towards the end of the line. Right? 
This cell activates clearly if we're in double quotes. It activates its, its extreme one way or another, basically, if we're in double quotes. Um, a different model was trained on Linux source code. And so this one basically tells whether you're inside the condition of an if statement. Right? Or this one, who the hell knows what that means, right? What has what, what it learned there? I don't know. Uh, but here's some others that turn on and off whether you're in comments or quotes. Here's one that gets more activated the deeper nested you are, right? One level of nesting, two, three, and four. Uh, and that is probably about what we want to do. Yep. So, as always, when you're designing your network, your architecture, part of what you're designing is how much hidden state do I want? If you were trying to do Linux source code or Wikipedia, having one cell is not going to be enough, right? You don't want to have one hidden state. You might want to have 10,000, probably not. A couple hundred, probably. Something like that. Yeah. Each of these neurons that we're talking about is scale out into C sub T. Uh -huh. It's one of those C sub T's. Yeah. Yep. All right, let's look now at the simplification of LSTM. It's called GRUs. So the picture of this so we have two gates instead of three gates. And we don't have any extra memory. So two gates, not three. And we have no C sub T. All we have is our H sub T. So what's going to happen? We have h sub t minus 1 coming in. And it can go one of sort of two ways. We can be multiplied by our weight matrix, or we can come in unchanged. So we have the same idea of there is a path where we don't use any matrix multiplication. Okay. We're going to come in. Our two gates are our update gate, which is called Z sub t, and our reset gate, which is R sub t. So the update comes through, and we have a gate here. And this gate is going to be 1 minus z sub t. So instead of, we're going to take a linear combination of two values, Okay, this, this, this uh, weighted combination that sums to 1. So 1 minus z sub t here. And this is going to be h sub t on our way out. We have x. We have w, x, h. We feed these together, as always. And add them together. We add them with our bias. We do a tan h here. And then I'm missing one part that I'll show in a moment. But we have another gate. That's z sub t. So we're going to take a portion of this and a portion of this. But the portions sum to 1. And 
I'm sorry if you're writing this diagram down. Here's where our other gate is. Okay, so this is our reset gate that allows us to forget whatever was stored in h sub t minus 1 here and just compute from our new value. So basically says, ignore this, just compute from our input what we have. Don't use what we had stored. So let's say we want to store something for a long time, just like we did with our C sub t and the LSTM. So we want to store something that says we're inside square brackets. What do we set R and U to? Rory. Sorry, I didn't Okay, so we're coming, we got our old H of T. We take the old H of T minus one and feed it through this gate. But you said only have two gates, right? Yeah, so this is what, well, we have two values, we have three gates. So this gate and this gate are connected to one another, <laughs> right? As you increase, as you open z sub t here, 1 minus z sub t shuts. Oh. So I'm considering these 1. Oh, okay. Okay. So if we want to store long term, what should z sub t be? One. What about R sub T? Doesn't matter. RT equals don't care. Because it doesn't matter whether this is open or closed and we kick that as we're still going to throw it away. Right? If Z sub T is, sorry, Z sub T is, let's not make it one. Let's make it exactly the opposite of one. Because we want this gate to be closed. And so we want it to be a one. And so we want it to be 1 minus the 0. And this one will be all the way open. And so therefore, it doesn't matter what happened here, what our sub t was. All right, GRUs versus LSDMs. Which has more parameters? Which has more um, matrices to learn? I guess LSDM. LSDM has to, right? It has three gates instead of two gates. We've also got this other intermediate value to store as well. So we've got to store the C sub t as well as the H sub t. So LSTM has more parameters. So actually, I'd say one thing. More parameters, more. State basically has twice as much state, right? Because we could have C sub t as well as H sub t. Um, more computation. Right? There's, we're doing more. But also more, let's say, power or expressiveness. We have a richer model. Which one do you use? That is a architectural decision. Uh, either one are reasonable to try. Questions? We learned some regularization techniques recently. Give me one that we learned over the last three weeks or something. Batch norm, okay, that's a good one. And another one? Dropout. Drop you might want to use dropout with an LSTM or a GRU. The problem is if you use dropout as a separate layer, it's basically
um, all or nothing applied before the LSTM runs or after. And you might want to have some intermediate dropout. That is from time step to time step to time step. Okay? Very similar to how we use dropout between two layers. You might want to use dropout between two time steps. And in fact, when you use dropout, you normally, in, a, in an LSTM, you would use it between every time steps. So from one to two, two to three, three to four, however long you're going, you would apply dropout. But it would not be different dropout every time. Whatever dropout you chose for this time step between one and two, you'd use that same dropout, two to three, three to four, four to five, and so on. So basically what it is is it turns some number of the H sub T's and so associated C sub T's to zero. It's like you no longer have that memory. Good luck. See how you do. Right? How well you could adapt. You had a question, then? Okay. Yeah. Which kind of makes sense because you it, it'd be a lot harder for it to, for it to learn if you said I want you to not use the inside double quotes uh, state for this time step, and then for the next time step I don't want to use the. Uh, how far I am along the line, one, and then a different one for the different time step. Yeah. I'm just a little confused about like what dropout is in this sense about like are we like assuming that we just like like how is it not like I guess I'm having trouble understanding like how it's not like dropping everything if we ever implementing this in the sense that okay you know we're gonna drop out we're gonna drop out this much hidden state or are we dropping out like you know. Um, so well, let's do the hidden state. Let's use that as an example. So what I'm saying is we're going to drop out some elements of our hidden state for this mini batch. Okay. So for this mini batch, for these however many k training examples, we no longer have. We we have some brain damage, right? We've, we've lost some of our hidden state, and so it has to just do as best it can to try and train with that. The next mini batch, we're going to lose something different. So every mini batch will have a slightly different configuration. And so that does give us this effect kind of of a bunch of differently trained networks that at the very end, when we turn off the dropout, we are ensembling in some sense. Rachel, you look quizzical. Okay, so here's why. Let's, let's look at the one of the gates and look at one of the equations for one of the gates. Okay? So let's look at the forget gate. Right? We're going to have a sigmoid of xt wxf plus ht minus 1 whf plus bf. This guy is constant, right? So we're learning that across all time steps. It's not time step dependent. But this is time step dependent, and this is time step dependent. These are shared right across all time steps. So if we look at, let's say, once it's fully trained, these guys will never change, right? But what we're saying is we do get to calculate for this time step dependent on what our input is at this time step and what our output was from the previous time step. So that's the state information that we can use. We could use this previous state, and we could use what our current input is. And so. This can allow us to have different values for different time steps. Certainly, different values for different combinations of input hidden state. So it's not learned. It'll be different when you test. When we test, these values of f and i and o are going to be dependent on what's the input 
and what's the previous hidden state, which means what's all our, dependent on all our previous input. Okay. So what we've seen already, calculated in these very ways, plus what we've seen right now. All right, so we have three more lectures. Uh, Wednesday, we are going to continue talking about RNNs, and Monday as well. At some point, we need to do evaluations. We'll do that either Wednesday or Monday. The last lecture is going to be a bonus lecture, I guess you put it. So it is what I call optimizing your engineering life and optimizing your financial life. So not, um, not deep learning specific. By the way, I'm teaching the same class next fall. So if anyone's interested in becoming a brooder, I'm looking for brooders.